Religious and cultural transformations were profound, but there were also social, economic, and political transformations taking place in Europe in the years after Columbus's discovery of the New World. A new global trading network emerged, the first global trade in human history. New World silver greatly increased the power of European monarchs, especially the Spanish king, and provided Europe a leg up on their competition from the Middle East and Asia. New World riches and direct trade routes with Asia increased the amount of Eastern trade goods accessible to European rulers. It also made European presence around the world much greater. Prior to 1500 and the emergence of the global maritime economy, European society consisted of three social classes, or three estates. Social classes inform us on how society is organized. The three-estate system came from the medieval period, dating back to the ending of the Roman Empire, around 500 CE. The three estates are those who pray, who are members of the clergy, those who fight, which is a reference to the old warrior class of the medieval period, the knights in shining armor who conquered their neighbors, and created legal and social systems to benefit their families and those people who were loyal to them. By the 1500s, this noble class is not a warrior class, but rather the descendants of the warrior class who still enjoy all the same social and legal privileges their ancestors created for them. And the third estate, which consists of everybody else, who up until 1500 were primarily farmers and serfs. The influx of trade in Europe from the New World and Asia leads to the rise of the merchant class, who had a much smaller role in European society previously. It also creates a new social class, the merchant class and those professions associated with the rise of commerce. We will call this the bourgeoisie, a wealthy upper middle class of European traders, craftspeople, and professionals that come from the third estate. In some cases, members of the bourgeoisie, though legally and socially below the first and second estates, are accumulating the type of wealth to be more powerful and influential than nobles or members of the church. Prior to 1500, most wealth in Europe came from land ownership. The church and nobility owned the land, but increasingly wealth is determined by ventures associated with expanding global trade. Joint stock companies allowed Europeans to pool resources together and invest in trading ventures. The joint stock company is the predecessor to our modern-day corporations. Investors in stock companies become stockholders, making money when the companies they invest in makes money. Stocks are bought and sold on stock exchanges, meaning people can be partial owners of multiple trading companies. So rather than land ownership being the be-all end-all of economic power in Europe, it is increasingly stock value, bank account holdings, and trade assets that mark one's wealth. This new bourgeoisie class, from the third estate, now threatens the traditional economic and social order. Politically, the major transformation in Europe is the ability for rulers to capitalize on this influx of wealth to further consolidate and expand their power. But politically, Europe is a mess. On the one hand, there is the city-state, most typically found on and around the Italian peninsula. Venice is a prime example. The city-state is a densely populated area of thriving economic activity, typically a very wealthy king, prince, a wealthy family, or group of families make the political decisions and control the matters within the city walls, typically also controlling neighboring farmland as a source for food for the city's inhabitants. These urban areas are prone to a lot of economic activity. The city-states that emerged in Italy were a result of the Mediterranean trade prior to the discovery of the New World which allowed powerful families and rulers to be the gatekeepers of Eastern goods in Europe. The resources of this trade helped spur the Renaissance and allowed these wealthy families to be the patrons of various artistic and architectural ventures. A handful of cities around the Mediterranean are organized this way. A different political structure in Europe was the Holy Roman Empire, which in name is a massive territory in Central Europe, recognized by the Pope and Church as a singular state. It has a Holy Roman Emperor who is recognized as the ruler of this territory, but actually has no power or authority. In reality, the Holy Roman Empire is fragmented into over a thousand different city-states, each having their own king slash queen to answer to, and frequently fighting with one another. A confederation of German states is a more accurate way of describing the political situation in Central Europe. As the Enlightenment thinker Voltaire put it, it's not holy, it's not Roman, and it's not an empire. The rest of European states organize themselves in one of two ways. The most common political system is absolute monarchy. 
Absolute monarchy is a political system in which the king or queen has absolute say within the realm. This power is passed down from one generation to the next, creating hereditary dynasties. Spain is a good example of absolutist rule. The Spanish king took 20% of all the silver out of the New World for his own personal bank account, making him one of the most powerful people in the world at the time. There was no check on his authority. The Spanish monarch enforced the three estates social system. Favors and privileges were given to the land-owning aristocracy and the noble class. The noble classes in Spain were required to pay 0% of the taxes, while members of the third estate carried the entire tax burden. Because the king's power was absolute, his word was law. The best example of an absolute monarch is in the case of France, specifically the ruler Louis XIV. Europe had many absolute monarchs, but Louis is a case study for how political power was centralized in one single person across the European landscape. King Louis's quote, I am the state, is an example of his absolute rule. The king is France, and France is the king. Louis referred to himself as the Sun King, illustrating the world revolving around him. His wealth and power was concentrated in his palace, the Palace of Versailles, a massive and lavish palace to represent physically the power and wealth of the king. Louis lived at the palace, which had 700 rooms and up to 20,000 people living there along with him. It served as the home for the king, but also where all political and governing decisions were made. Louis's largest political threat, and this was true of monarchs across Europe, was the aristocracy and noble classes. There were historically the wealthy and powerful, and Louis as a child was abducted by a group of French nobles in an effort to take his throne. Louis solves the problem of nobles threatening his power by requiring them to live at the palace with him. This allows Louis to keep an eye on the nobility and prevents them from plotting against the king. While at the palace, he pacifies the nobility, throwing lavish parties and having them engage in an overindulgence of eating, drinking, and sexual pleasures. A nobility that eats and drinks and dances is a lot less threatening than a nobility that trains and fights. In order to run his empire, Louis hires bureaucrats outside of the nobility, pays them well, grants them a comfortable living, and has a much stronger sense of trust and loyalty with these third estate bureaucrats because the king has provided them a path of social mobility. Louis and other European monarchs claim the authority to rule through divine right. Divine right states that it is God's will for kings to rule over men. In essence, to oppose an absolute monarch is to oppose the will of God. Louis XIV also enjoys the record for the longest serving monarch in world history, ruling for over 70 years. He is the best example of what an absolute ruler can do for their realm in terms of stability, prosperity, and expansion. It's what absolute rulers across Europe aspire to be. Other European nations with absolutist rulers include Russia, Austria, and Prussia. The other major political structure in Europe is the parliamentary system. The Netherlands and England are parliamentary systems. A parliament is a group of nobles who are there to keep the king's power in check. Though England and the Netherlands have a king and or queen, it's this group of nobles, the parliament, that has the final say in legal and political matters. The nobility checks the monarchy. Parliamentary England before and after 1500 is characterized by conflict after conflict between the monarch and the parliament. Some of the origins of this relationship and the conflict between the parliament and the monarch in England date back to 1215, when the Magna Carta was written. The Magna Carta stated the English monarch was subject to the law and not above it. In absolutist systems, the monarchs were the law. For 400 years, the two sides battle for power. The most recent conflict between the monarchy and parliament was the English Civil War between 1640 and 1660, when King Charles I of England attempted to raise taxes without the consent of parliament. Also, there was a paranoia that Charles may bring the country back to the Catholic Church, something fundamentally opposed by a Protestant parliament. In the English Civil War, parliament wins, executing King Charles I in the process. It's not really until the late 1680s that stability and order are brought back to England, and for good measure, the Parliament passes the English Bill of Rights in 1689. In short, the rights protected people's rights from the monarchy and took powers away from the king. 
it made Parliament the vital authority when it came to the English government. Nations like the Netherlands and England, who use parliamentary systems, have their advantages over absolutist systems. One advantage of parliamentary systems was their ability, in the long run, to do better commercially. Parliament could check the power of the monarchy and not allow for something like a 20% tax that the Spanish king enjoyed. Parliaments could also be stockholders, and that meant that they passed laws that would be beneficial to business. As businesses profited, stockholders profited. By the 1700s, it's England and the Netherlands who assume control and superiority of overseas trade. Whether a city-state, absolutist ruler, or parliamentary system, one thing was true about Europe after the 1500s, and that was most European nations were in a constant state of warfare. Wars could be religious, political, economic, but they were constant. Constant warfare led to an arms race and vast improvements to weapon technology. By the 17 and 1800s, the best weapons in the world are in Europe. It was the case that either a nation adopted the best weapons or be conquered. The case of Polish-Lithuania is the great example. A massive power in the 1500s, but lost ground militarily and by the 1800s no longer existed. Poland was ruled by Russia and the predecessor to the German state, Prussia. These wars are very expensive. The sources of wealth provided by the New World and trade in Asia was a major source for these conflicts, but war debts and problems with financing increases as the years go on, and states find more creative and effective ways of raising revenues, including taxation. These war debts become a major cause for the political upheaval in the years after 1750.